I'm Richard Parks, former Welsh rugby international turned professional endurance athlete. And I push my body to the limit in some of the world's most extreme and remote environments. Yet one thing I've learned is that some of the best adventures can be had right here in Wales, on my doorstep. Or should I say, underneath my doorstep. Welcome to my big Welsh adventure. 2016 is the Welsh year of adventure, and to celebrate it, I've set myself three very different adventure challenges. Cycling south to north through the glorious Welsh mountains, creating a new cycle route, the highest in Wales. And following the River Tyvi from source to sea, running and kayaking on one of the longest rivers in the country. This time I'm going underground, caving in the Brecon Beacons, on a mega mission that will take me to the deepest point of the deepest cave system in the UK. <laughs> what lies underground is of huge significance to Wales and its people. This is Cumdur an open cast limestone quarry in the Brecon Beacons National Park. It was mined for hundreds of years. At the industry's peak, 14 and a half million tons of limestone per year was extracted and exported from quarries like this one. Vast scars on the landscape tell the story of how Welsh people once depended on this, their country's mineral wealth. Today, the industry here is a thing of the past, but thanks to its remarkable geology, these rocks are still very much in use. Beneath me is an incredible system of limestone caves. Their creation began 300 million years ago, when all this was a tropical seabed thousands of miles south of here. As the tectonic plates collided, these ancient seabeds were shunted north. Huge pressures buckled the rock, thrusting it to the surface, creating the Welsh landscape we see today. All around me are telltale signs of the limestone world I'm about to enter. Home to caves, but also to rare and beautiful alkaline-loving plants. Like this, Riddlesdale's hawkweed. It may look like a common or garden dandelion, but this species is one of the special ones. According to Natural Resources Wales, who manage this reserve, there are some species of hawkweed, like that little fella up there, that are so rare, they're only found here in this quarry. But the ground beneath this quarry is where I'm heading for the next two days. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little nervous about this challenge. I'd much rather be climbing a mountain than going deep underground. There are over 1,000 caving sites in Wales, and this is an exceptional example. The Ogolf V cave system, or OFD for short, is the deepest cave not only in Wales, but in the UK. It runs through the mountains in the west of the Brecon Beacons. This is a two-day adventure. Day one, I'll explore the top section of the cave, a maze of tunnels and passages with spectacular rock formations. Day two, I'm on a 15-hour mission, starting at the cave's top entrance and dropping over 900 feet to the lowest point in the system. I'm meeting Gary Evans from the South Wales Caving Club and Mid Wales Cave Rescue Team, who's going to be with me as I explore underground. Richard. Hi, Gary. How are you good doing? Good to meet you. Yeah, really you. good, thanks. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Looking forward to this? <laughs> uh, i got mixed feelings about it, yeah? if I'm being honest. I'm a little uh, apprehensive about it. I, uh, I'm not a massive fan of confined spaces. OK. I'd say I'm 60% uh, excited, 40% nervous. Well, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised. It's it's real big in here. It's a bit deceiving, isn't it? Because it is. It looks see... like ominous. That does. Yeah. So yeah. it's got a gate on it. Yeah. And that's really for a couple of reasons. Uh, it, it conserves the caves, and also from a safety point of view, it means you haven't got people wandering around in there, getting lost. So it's a small entrance, protecting over 60 kilometres of passage. Gary's kitting me out with essential safety gear: a caving belt used as a harness and a helmet. I feel like it accentuates my hips as well. <laughs> as I feared. It's not going to be a walk in the park. Yeah, right, we've got a bag each as well. Yep. So we've got some safety gear and some other bits of equipment. Uh, I guess we could uh, make our way underground when you're ready. OK, Richard. 
Within just a few seconds, we are plunged from bright sunlight into total darkness. All I can hear is the distant drips through an eerie silence. You'd expect it to be cold in here, but it's not. In fact, this cave has a year-round ambient temperature of 12 degrees Celsius. We're just going to have a little sit down just here. Have a, have a seat there. So we're, we're in the cave, so we're just going to turn our lights off for a moment, few moments, let our eyes adjust, and we'll, we'll sit here in the dark for a couple of minutes. Wow. So that's um, pitch black. It's a very primal darkness, isn't it? Yeah. It's darkness unlike, you know, you'd experience in, uh, in the normal world, because there's always light pollution of some sort. I'm looking at you, but I have no idea yeah, if you you're know, looking I'm, at me. I'm, I'm Are you looking, looking at me? At Are you I still am, there? I am, yeah. I can, I can hear your voice, and <laughs> I feel I should look that way. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it is. No, you're right. It's pitch black, and there is, because there's no light, our eyes just can't adjust to it. Yeah. So what's happening is our pupils are dilating, trying to find light. So by turning our lights off, it allows our pupils to dilate, looking for whatever light they can find, which means we're going to see much better when we turn our lights on again in a moment. Sure. So if you're ready, yep. we can pop our lights on and uh, make some progress. What's that? You still there? <laughs> <laughs> Come on in. It's incredibly hazardous going, which I'm used to as an experienced mountaineer. But this is all new for me. I've never been caving before. Normally, I can see where I'm stepping. Just take your time, just watch where you put your feet. Gary, I can hear the, uh, the drips. Yeah. Is it water that created these caves? Yeah, it was. And it's amazing to think, isn't it, all these huge passageways formed just by water action. It rains, yeah. and that rain falls through the air, picks up carbon dioxide, yeah. picks up more carbon dioxide in the soil, which forms a weak acid called carbonic acid. Okay. And when that comes into contact with the limestone, it dissolves it. And it's that that starts to form the passageways. So if you look up into the roof, you can see right up there is where the passages first formed. What surprises people is that the oldest part is the highest part, and we're in the newest part. It's fascinating. Fascinating. Should you crack on? Yeah, great. Yeah. One of the first rules of caving is never enter a cave alone, and I'm just beginning to see why. And it's like a labyrinth in here. I can imagine it's pretty easy to get disorientated and, and even lost. So just like above ground, I'd use a map to navigate. I've got a map here, but cavers refer to them as surveys. Gary wants to see how I'd cope if he were injured or if I found myself alone. In an exercise experienced cavers practice, he's asked me to navigate through a maze of tunnels towards a chamber called Gnome Passage. So where we're standing, there's seven ways on from here. And there's a couple of ways behind. There's a way up here. Yeah. It's a way going that way. Yeah. And then there's three more below us. So you need to make a choice now uh, and get us on track. Even with my survey, this is totally different from navigating above ground. This is an alien world, and I'm not used to reading the rocks. So to me, every option looks pretty much the same. I would say we go ahead and take the left passage over there. OK, confident? Always. Come on then, let's have a look. As we head off, we find more passages with different route options. I soon realize how easily you can become disorientated in here. Okay. I think that we're there, which means that it's straight on and to the left. You must have some stories of uh, people getting lost down here. A couple of years ago, we had a, uh, I think, 12 to 15 hour search. We just didn't know where they were in the system, so we had to put a number of search teams in. Well, now's not the time for horror stories, I guess. Well, you're doing really well so far, so let's Cheers. just keep that going. <laughs> Cheers, man. All right. <laughs> we're only 200 feet horizontally into the cave. I'm navigating in this pitch black labyrinth with only our head torches to light the way. On the right is the little side passage we did the don't tape Don't tell in. me, don't tell me. Am I going the wrong way? You have. Uh, oh, well. It's a really common junction for mistakes there. People take the wrong turn in. Gary takes control of the navigation again, but this exercise has certainly given me confidence if we were to be separated. I'm now able to focus on the raw beauty of the environment around me. 
tell me the story behind some of the colours that we can see. It's quite interesting. It's complex, really. We're seeing a lot of different things. Some of it is the uh, calcite on the walls. That's that white you're oh, seeing on yeah. the wall there. And also all the, the, the mud colour, the sandy colour, that's caused by glaciation, really. All of the material that they dragged across the surface uh, has come in with the meltwater and flooded into the cave, and that's all the mud on the floor and on the walls that we're seeing. This cave was first discovered in 1946, and there are still parts of this system where fewer people have stood than on the surface of the moon. In fact, caves are the only places left in the UK where genuine new exploration still occurs. The OFD is a site of special scientific interest and its contents are closely guarded. I've arranged to meet Alan Boring, a geologist from the Brecon Beacons National Park Authority, and Claire Vivian, a cave warden with a special interest in conservation, who are going to tell me more about their work. I've learned from, uh, from Gary that there are sections of this cave that, you know, are like time capsules from you know, millions of years ago. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. That's very true then. There's a lot of very fragile formations here as well. You know, one a careless boot in the wrong place could destroy something that has wow. been, has been you know, busy growing for thousands of years. They are conserving calcite pools created by puddles of water which have filled and drained over hundreds of thousands of years. All of this rock is made of calcite, but we're seeing it in a crystalline form here, uh, all of which are slightly different. There's some wonderful ones further down Nome Passage. We're actually very close to the entrance of Nome Passage. It's one of the cave's most impressive features, and Alan tells me I need something more powerful than a few head torches to see it. Wow. It's quite something, isn't it? The famous Nome Passage. <laughs> That's massive. I wasn't expecting it to be that big. It's hard to articulate, but it you could easily fit the body of a jumbo jet in there. Oh, you'd lose the whole plane. Yeah. This magnificent chamber is at points 30 feet wide, 30 feet high, and an incredible 260 feet long. Ah, Alan, I can see why it's called Gnome Passage now. Before my eyes, Hundreds of stalagmites. Huddled together, the cave version of lonely garden gnomes. That's, uh, that's an incredible feature. It looks like wax, doesn't it? It did. over the rock. It's exactly what it looks like, yeah. How does water actually create that? The water picks up carbon dioxide. It becomes a very weak acid. And what that can do is dissolve limestone. So it carries the limestone in solution, but when it gets to a place like this, it releases a little bit of that calcium carbonate. That's calcite. But if you've got drip after drip after drip over a long, long period, that's what you end up with. How many years are we talking here? Like, uh, roughly, I mean... Well, if you can imagine a millimetre of this material being added every 10 years, Okay. Out. It's, it's, a lo it's a long, long time. Thousand, hundreds of thousands of we years. We could stand here for yeah. a whole lifetime, so we wouldn't see much change. There's plenty to see on the floor of the cave. But when I look up, there are equally stunning stalactites. It's so cool to be so close to them and to be able to see the detail so clearly. It looks like fabric flowing, doesn't it? Yeah. Or oh, streaky bacon. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I like, I like, I can, I can, I can. And this tiny stalactite there, it goes from sort of a, an amber into a dark brown into a white, and the tip is, is clear. The, the clear tip is pretty much pure calcite. Yeah. And the darker colours, those rich oranges, ambers, yeah. you see, yeah. brown, that's iron. My eyes have been truly open to this subterranean world. Natural beauty slowly forming here in the darkness for hundreds of thousands of years. I've been exploring underground for nine hours now. This cave is a conservation area, so no camping. We have no choice but to retrace our steps back to the entrance. It's day two, and I'm still caving with Gary and Claire. Today, I'm dropping over 900 feet from the top entrance to the deepest point of the cave. Once in the system, there's no way to communicate with the surface, so we have to put a time limit on the trip. Experienced cavers take five hours to complete this demanding challenge, but with a film crew and kit in tow, it'll take us considerably longer. 
Within 15 hours, we must re-emerge and call in to avoid a rescue. On my way, I'll have to twist through the corkscrew, belay down Maypole Inlet, and travel through the streamways. I'll have to climb the diver's pitch and crawl through the letterbox, finally arriving at the bottom of Gothic Passage, the end of my journey. Let's do this. This giant hole was formed by an ancient river that once filled this chamber. As the water cut through the rock, it left this huge crevasse. Hi, Claire. Hi. <laughs> Very quickly, we reached yes. the first of many narrow sections. This one is known as the corkscrew. You might be laughing now, being so small, but I'm sure my long legs are going to come in handy at some point. I can see why this is called the corkscrew now. There's just not a bottle of wine at the end of it. <laughs> I'm six foot two, so I'm having to twist and contort my body in order to push myself through these tiny gaps. This seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Famous last words. I've literally popped out of the corkscrew and can stand up again. I soon realize that the nature of the cave has changed dramatically. We have transitioned from dry to wet caving. You know, we've come into a really different part of the cave now, haven't we? It feels really different. I can hear the water and... Yeah. We've got something interesting to show you just here on the right. This is a gastropod. Wow. To think that that would have been living on the seabed around 330 million years ago is uh, incredible. In fact, these limestone caves are almost completely made of crushed sea creatures and corals. That's really cool. Yeah. Fossils and all. Loads of fossils. Is that why you love this place so much, or you love caving so much? For me, it's a big adventure, but it's also incredibly pretty, incredibly beautiful. I, and the sights you see here, few people will see you. It's a bit like, um, you know, when I'm on an expedition or when I'm climbing, you forget to take it in and just, there's so much going on in here, oh, isn't there? It's absolutely amazing. If you just stomp through quickly, you miss a lot of what's oh, going yeah, on. So yeah. just taking a moment to pause, have a look up, have a look around you, get the whole experience, it's well worth it. Wales is equally amazing underground as it is above ground. There's a myriad of changing landscapes, and each one comes with different physical challenges. Caving is a total body workout. because I guess it's either laugh or, uh, or start to freak out because I, I actually can't turn my head around. <laughs> yeah. This is Maypole Inlet. It's a narrow gully that spirals and drops 36 feet to a small stream that eventually joins the main streamway. Now this is what I imagine caving would be like. It's a technical beast and hard to climb down. I can't stop thinking that it would be even harder to climb back up. I have the feeling that from here, there's no turning back. Right now, I'm glad that Gary's on the end of my belay. Can I get some more slack, please, mate, Gar? Thank you. We've now travelled nearly 300 feet on the vertical range 
down from the entrance. Well, I've uh, I've never been this far underground. You know, this is a really significant adventure. I didn't know what to expect. I I'm not a massive fan of confined spaces, but the challenge is sort of controlling the inner dialogue in your mind. When you really think that, you know, we're deep underground here and we're going deeper. The boy in me is just thinking what monster is going to be around next corner. And that monster is called the Lower Streamway. This starts with a climb down a waterfall followed by a long traverse dropping ever deeper, all along an underground river. I'm roped up on this climb. Being so far underground, if I was to fall, it would be almost impossible to get me out. If the water is dangerously high when we get to the river at the bottom, we won't be able to pass through it, halting our mission to climb down to the deepest part of the cave. Gary will make the final decision. Yeah. This is a really key part of our adventure as we drop into the lowest waterway. And as you can imagine, if water levels were high, this would be a really dangerous part. We'd have had to turn around and climb all the way back up that and out that way. But we're in good hands. Gary's happy with the water levels. We've been blessed with a few good days of weather above ground. We can keep going anyway, that's a good thing. There's a lot of water around me. If the level is above your boots, that means that further downstream the passage is flooded and too dangerous to navigate. This is a bigger and more visceral adventure than I ever imagined. The noise is deafening. We're all soaking wet, and fatigue is taking hold. We now really are at the mercy of what's going on above ground. Welsh weather can change in an instant. That's water from an inlet being fed from the surface. And it's one of the few connections that we have with the world above us. But the fact that that's flowing so heavily means that it's almost definitely raining above ground now. As we move further into the streamway, I'm met by swirling pools of chest-deep, fast-flowing water. I have to do some serious clambering over the wet rock. But it's the water flowing over this rock that is responsible for the fantastic spectacle ahead. Well, we, I feel like we're in, we're in another really distinctive part of the cave now. You're right. I mean, this is Paul Marble showers yeah. all of it. And here's the showers. <laughs> yeah. and, and here's the marble effect. Yeah. And this, the white striations we're seeing, that's the same calcite as in the stalagmites and stalactites, formed in a slightly different way, because all of the calcite we're seeing has been, is populating what were cracks. OK. So what you had were cracks that have been formed by some kind of stress fracture. The calcite has, kind of, has crystallised into the cracks, and we're seeing the cracks now full of calcite. They're beautiful. They really are, aren't they? I've been wet for the best part of five hours now. Luckily, I'm heading towards a drier part of the cave. We've just climbed out of the main streamway and now into the dry section of the caves. Having been wet for the last few hours, it's, it's good to get in the dry part, but the next section is called Diver's Pitch, and it's quite uh, an infamous part of this route. And it's going to be a tight squeeze. However, the rainfall above means that it doesn't stay dry for long. And within minutes, once again, I'm drenched. Drive in! This is Diver's Pitch. 
a waterfall that cascades off a 40-foot sheer cliff face. I'm used to climbing, but I'm going to have to concentrate on this one. I thought this was supposed to be a dry part of the cave. <laughs> this is full on. After my climb, I go straight into what cavers technically call a squeeze. And now I know why. Mate, do I get rid of this bag? Let me see if I can put it behind me. Uh. And as I've mentioned before, I'm not the biggest fan of tight spaces. It's tough going, really exhausting work. And I'm constantly battling to control my growing anxiety. Thankfully, I'm nearly at the end of this crawl. One final push, and I'm through. Oh my god, I can't believe I came through that. <coughs> wow, this is actually pretty cool. You wouldn't want to come out here and have a fall, though, would you? It's a long way down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah, they look a bit. Dodgy, yeah. don't they? Yeah. The journey from here continues to get tougher. Still ahead are a series of climbs, squeezes, waterways and passages descending the final 200 feet. We have to push on. We only have four hours to exit the cave and call in before the rescue team are dispatched. I'm not giving up. I'm going to fight it till the end. Well, this is it. The deepest point in this cave system. I've never spent this long underground, and I never realised that there's such a, a magical world down here. It's been an awesome day and an awesome adventure. Nearly 15 hours underground and a vertical descent of over 900 feet past amazingly beautiful cave formations. Evidence of ancient creatures. And through some seriously technical challenges. It's a lovely day when we went in there. <laughs>